name is Tom Cole, head coach of South Medford High School out of Medford, Oregon. Okay, uh, just tell me about the history of, of your program and, and uh, your accomplishments. I took over the program. This is my sixth season there. We uh, started uh, with a program that had a national history and a boys program that were nationally ranked, and our girls program had not won a, a game in two two years. They were 0-48 in my first season taking over. And um, in five years, uh, we went from a team that had not won a game to a team that went 30-0. and uh, It was a first in Oregon history and the first state championship for the high school. Okay. Um Tell us about your expertise as a coach, uh, what, what your training mechanisms are to uh, grow an organization or team of you, this caliber. You know, I was lucky. I grew up in uh, Missouri and had a chance to uh, work for a, a coach named Charlie Spoonhauer, who um, was at Missouri State at that time, Southwest Missouri State, before moving on. He coached at UNLV uh, before passing away. and. You know, I, I think I got a, a good opportunity to, to learn uh, from someone who had been a lifelong member of, a, of the basketball coaching tree and uh, his philosophy about preparation and, uh, and, and uh, the mechanics of, of getting everybody on the same page was something I, I still embrace both for, um, for as, a, as a coach but also for uh, instructing kids for life. What do you feel is the... Um, uh, the pros and cons or the pros for young ladies to choose uh, competitive forms of athletics? In our community, like a lot of communities, I think, uh, on the West Coast, um, we have, um, our community is a school that serves a lot of kids in poverty, but a lot of kids who come from uh, families where their parents uh, are not uh, citizens of this country, that um, have not uh, really had an opportunity to to play sports as a kid because of language barriers and cost barriers and for us um, we recognized uh, through the youth organization I run called Kids Unlimited that if we could remove a lot of the barriers around why kids of poverty couldn't play and in this case with the Latino population um, not only money but 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 making sure that um, that families understood the value of, of being a part of something and, and being included um, opened up not only success for them transitioning into teams, but but also transitioning into uh, accomplishments in life. You know, they could see themselves as being capable of making a team. They could see themselves as being capable of producing in a classroom. They could then see themselves as being capable of having a goal uh, bigger than just school, uh, looking at uh, life goals and moving on into higher education. And so. Uh, for us, um, and especially with girls, I think um, we, we see in our community and, and many communities on the West Coast that the highest teen parents uh, are, are Latina females, you know, because of the cultural norms that many young ladies uh, should become just homemakers and, as opposed to seeing themselves capable of careers uh, as, as young people. Um, well, at that point, uh, tell me what you, what you think the state of uh, Scholastic Girls basketball and sports, sports competition level. Well, I think, um, you know, I, I've been in Oregon uh, for, for, for just over 15 years. And I think um, I'm proud that, that the state um, of uh, moving from Missouri, I, uh, I, I didn't feel that there was the same emphasis on, on women's sports. Uh, I was uh, fortunate enough to be around some competitive women's uh, collegiate programs in the early 90s uh, at uh, Southwest Missouri State, which became Missouri State, and they were a Final Four team. But um, the development and uh, ability for young ladies to play in AAU wasn't as uh, prominent then. Uh, there was a scene of boys that, uh, that was emerging, you know, a national scene in the, in the late 80s, early 90s, but it uh, wasn't real prevalent with girls. And when you came out to Oregon, I was surprised that uh, a school in Oregon called Oregon City had really uh, become a national powerhouse because they had developed um, a system that really started getting girls playing sports at an early age. You know, so you had young ladies who were ba bouncing a basketball in the first and second grades, and and as they became successful both uh, on the state and regional level, but also as a national powerhouse, it, it created an atmosphere that high schools had to start to um, to also look at at similar ways of developing kids. And I think. 
that um, you know seeing Oregon do that and seeing um, that that trend evolve nationally when we go to tournaments all over the West Coast and now nationally to see that these kids have been playing for such a long period of time that the athleticism and the skill level is on par with most uh, boys programs. If I were a parent, how would you? Con what would be your convincing statement or conversation to uh, tell me the advantage of my young daughter competing in competitive athletics? Well, you know, I um, part of the privilege I think of coaching young women uh, sometimes is also comes out of the recognition that that there are many young ladies who don't have very strong male role models in their life and. Uh, I think sports is is one of those parallel uh, uh, kind of um, environments where you can teach life and you know what what we have tried to convey to to the young ladies that participate in our program is that if you will settle for less around uh, whether it be a timed run or uh, a goal around a certain number of shots or uh, a length of practice, if you will begin to settle for less in sports, you will become uh, someone who settles for less less in life and as uh, as men we have always been conditioned that sports is a is a is a really important part of developing masculinity and is a part of uh, of our identity and, and a culture and I think uh, as the girls game has evolved we've we've recognized that those same traits are characteristic of winners in life you know that 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 you should be assertive that you should not settle for less in a relationship that you should not uh, believe that you are incapable of achieving a goal. And I think that um, that, that is probably the most important piece that uh, sports uh, can do for both boys and for, for young ladies. If, um, if, if um, I were to give you the opportunity to say, what would you like to see done tomorrow uh, to uh, continue to develop this sport or sports for young women, what would you say would be the reason? You know, I think that um, sports, like a lot of things, there's a universal barrier that's um, uh, around opportunity. And, you know, when you start to look at why certain kids don't play sports or why certain kids don't uh, evolve in sports, oftentimes it's because of uh, barriers around money, uh, availability, uh, sometimes uh, not having positive uh, role models or coaches who will who will take on those kind of challenges to make sure that 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 good opportunities are available for for young people. So I think you know as a as a as a whole, our culture has to improve upon creating those kind of um, removing you know financial barriers or the logistics around transfer, transportation for single parents or for families who who may not speak uh, the language. You know, so that all kids get in, get access to to an opportunity that truly can better their, their life, whether or not they ever play competitive basketball or not. Uh, this is going to be my last question as far as the development of the student athlete. Uh, how, what, what would be the best uh, way to, uh, uh, what would be the formula in sports to start my girl, my daughter out in uh, basketball, the sport of basketball? What, when do I start her? How do I start her? What do I um, put her in, get her involved in? Well, I think it has to be fun, you know, first and foremost. It is a game, and sometimes uh, as games evolve, they become uh, less fun and become a lot more about other, uh, oftentimes other people's egos, coaches and parents. And, uh, and, and, but, I, but I think that um, it has to be fun. It, it's got to be an opportunity where they can feel like they can accomplish something, that they can be a part of a, a sense of belonging, a, t a spirit of teamwork. And, and I also think that it's, um, it's about practicing habits that are bigger than basketball, you know, because uh, those habits do translate into classroom, uh, to pursuing a job or, or maintaining a relationship. And, and I think that when you find something good like that, it has to be, you know, you, you have to work just as hard to make sure that, that the, the small things don't ruin it for, for a young person just beginning. What is the title now? What did we go to from here? Well, I think you, you can't get complacent. You know, I think um, the tides are starting to change, and I think kids can feel the equality uh, and, and the availability uh, to participate in these sports. But I think there has to be more um, opportunities for young kids to, to engage in this. I think that's why you see the game 
at its evolution now is because here 15, 20 years after some of the initial Title IX legislation uh, and the concentration of improving opportunities, you now see that girls who have been playing basketball for 10 years, you know, that, that have had a basketball in their hands since first and second grade. And uh, that's far different than the years even uh, that I graduated from high school where um, there was certainly a huge deficit between skill sets of female high school athletes and that were uh, young women versus young men, much because of the availability and the frequency of which they, they were able to, to, to play the game. State your name, your origin, and uh, your reason for being, and, and a little bit of your history as far as you being involved with uh, girls' athletics. Okay, I'm uh, I'm Mike Bozeman. I'm the co-founder of MISNI, which is My Sports Network International. I'm here, uh, and we're doing the uh, we're contracted to do the conference part to manage the conference part and the workshops of this uh, the 40th annual. Uh, I'm sorry, the fourth annual uh, Title IX tournament here in Washington, D.C. Okay, well, tell us a little bit about your history. Um, this time last year, I was a head coach at George Washington University. I've been coaching basketball now for, for 20 odd years. Um, I was the head coach at Bishop McNamara High School. We uh, made a strong run for seven years straight, and when our run ended when we went to number one in the country in the USA Today. Oh, oh, excuse me. Get you to sit right here. Oh, sure. Yeah, so he has some eye Look this way? Yeah. Oh. yeah. You never know how, how this might be you last. Okay. In the documentary format. All right. Okay, it's so funny. Oh, still rolling? Yeah. Okay, uh, would you want to start over? You can. Okay, um, I started out at Bishop McNamara High School. Um, when I took over at McNamara, we was, uh, we was at the bottom of the most tough, con toughest conference in the country, WCAC. And in, in uh, three years, we flipped it around. Uh, the fourth year, we were number one in the country in the USA Today and, and the Street and Smith magazine. And uh, traveled to places like uh, Phoenix, Arizona. Played in tournaments in San Antonio, uh, Charlotte, North Carolina. So, uh, and uh, Bob Hedden, who was, the, who was the coach at H.D. Woodson, I stood by and was witness to what he was doing at H.D. Woodson. And that gave, that gave me the bug to want to try to take my teams national, my program national. So, uh, and no, I know he's affiliated with this program here uh, with um, the Title IX program, and, and that's, that was really encouraging to me. So um, after my tenure at, at George Washington University, I had a conversation with Ms. Johnson, and you could feel the passion in her voice and, and, and her pursuits of this, of this program and, and this tournament. And, she calls it a conference, and, and it very much so is a conference. So um, that's exactly what Misney does. We, uh, we are a multi-level, um, multi-sport enrichment program, and we, uh, we aim to make uh, athlete citizens, better athlete citizens of the world. It's an international program. It's going to be worldwide. And uh, what we do, we do such uh, workshops as health and wellness, so that the athlete knows what to put in their body to make them maximize their potential. We do programs such as uh, financial literacy. Uh, I know everybody's familiar with the ESPN um, 30 for 30 show they had and was broke. Well, with that, with that show, um, we aim to, to, to make sure the athlete understands that ath athletics can only go so far as a temporary, it's a temporary uh, career and we want you to be prepared, want them to be prepared to excel in life after that. So we have, um, I said financial literacy, we have health and wellness, we have an etiquette, a etiquette um, element to it. Um, we have, obviously we have the athletic element where we still want to enrich people in their chosen sport. Um, my, my thing is basketball, and each sport has their own emblem to it. NBA is basketball, my basketball academy. We have my football academy, my swimming academy, my track and field academy, um, and so forth, my soccer academy. So in those specialties, we have, um, we have physical fitness instructors to come in and cross-train you in, those, in, in your chosen sport. So it's a very innovative uh, program. We're going to uh, keep pursuing and keep pushing. It's going to be worldwide, and that's how our affiliation came 
to be, and we joined forces and, and, and came to be a, um, a sponsor for the, for the workshops here with uh, the Title IX tournament. If you want to pull your chain out, Oh, it's messed up. Put it in here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But I ain't no, I ain't no gangster. Oh, oh. Dang, I'm babe. so sorry. That broke the that thing, babe. I'm sorry. That was Stand it up. Either. This way? No, it's tough. Yeah. yeah. Okay, for that. Now, uh, in, in, in retrospect to that, um, what do you think that uh, female athletics is at this point as far as uh, in the realm of all athletics uh, in that development that, that's um, I think uh, the pursuit is to is to have it been take being taken a little more seriously like I know coaching women's basketball our arenas are we play a very high brand of basketball and the arenas are, are half full and you go to any men's basketball game arenas are full and um, that's something that we just have to introduce to the public the seriousness of these of these athletes. The athletes have to take it serious. The athletes have to understand this is a stepping stone. You to use athletics and not let athletics use you. Um, I know when I was coming out of school, my father told me college was mandatory. He just couldn't pay for it. So to me, that meant I'm gonna go and, and, and hone my skills. I'm gonna be serious about my workouts. I'm gonna be serious of what I put in my body, health and wellness. I'm gonna be serious what I put in my mind, academic, academic enrichment. I'm gonna be serious about uh, my attitude, you know, we have a, a healthy, a healthy confidence workshop. I'm gonna be serious about these things. So we're trying to introduce this. This is not just a, a, a female thing, but we do. We, we're a unisex uh, program. We want to get the females to understand the significance and the power that they have, and to and to maximize their abilities to 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 to, to, mac, to pursue that. As far as what you understand, even about the student athlete, uh, where do you think? Uh, the female student athlete is at this point in their development? Uh, I think um, for the most part, uh, I think ADs and on the college level are just trying to satisfy their requirements for Title IX. I don't know how much, uh, how serious I think um, in, in some sports are still not fully funded. Um, you know, basketball is, a, in, in, on some levels, it's a pain, painstaking uh, adventure for, for athletic directors. Um, it's more or less just don't just only lose me a certain amount of money. Um, they're not considered a revenue sport, um, although we piggyback off of the men. It's not considered a revenue uh, a revenue sport. So um, there's still there's still a journey to be to be made in order to get taken seriously on on the landscape of college athletics. If I have a, a young lady that uh, I point toward uh, being a student athlete, what would you prescribe as the interim, interim of her development? I think she needs to maximize uh, her skills first. I think um, she needs to take it serious and really understand what her goal is and, and understand that uh, athletics is, a, is yet a vehicle for her to maximize uh, a, a major goal. I mean, there's, there's, you know, um, there's only like 0.9% of, of college athletes uh, women basketball players, that is, that go on to be professionals in that sport. So, um, you know, the NCAA has a great commercial that says 99, uh, 90 percent uh, of student athletes will be professionals in something other than their sport. So it is definitely a vehicle. It's a way to get your education paid for. It's a it's a way to, to get you uh, to travel the country, to travel the world. But it's most certainly not a, a, a something that's going to be a lifelong um, venture. Sports is just temporary. The air has to go out of the ball. But the knowledge that you, you gain and, and the resources that you're exposed to, those things can carry you for a lifetime. Also, um, looking at the aspects of uh, the concussions within the football arena, uh, what are the pros and, cron pros and cons for the female student athlete in the origin? I mean, can I start her out too early or when, when would you prescribe? When do they start and how do, how do they develop? You know, um, I, I don't think you can start them out too early. As, as soon as they're able to run and jump and, and to do uh, some physical, some, some physical uh, uh, as soon as they display some physical, physical attributes, I think you should get them started because uh, the women are generally 
take them a little longer to progress athletically than it does the guys. Uh, they're a little behind the curve on that. They're catching up. Um, but the sooner you can get them started and work with the coordination, the better you'll be all, uh, the better they'll be able to perform. Um, I was recently looking at uh, some uh, highlights from the Nike Nationals in Phoenix. Yes, sir. And what I did notice was the gyms were very sparse as far as attendance with some of the nationally ranked teams. Um, what would be what would you what, what would you prescribe to uh, promote the interest in? Well, well you know that's funny. What you would you sell? to the public to say, why come see this? Uh, yeah, that's funny because that's the same, that's the same trend that happens in college. Uh, you have some gems. I mean, if you go to the Midwest, they're filling their gems up. If you go up to Yukon, he's filling his gem up, Tennessee's. But those are far and few between as it relates to the overall body of work in college basketball. So now you go to the high school basketball. It's the, uh, one of the top tournaments in the country, 96 teams. And, um, you know, you have a hard time you know, filling up the gym. Huh? Uh, the top team, sometimes uh, the gym was full. There's only half a gym that's filled, but um, I don't know how we get more people into the, in, into the arenas. Um, it's just, that's, that's the perplexing part about, about women's athletics is to, is to gain the public appeal to it, to get the public interest in it, uh, to, to take the female athletes serious. I think um, the more we promote it, the more we, we take it serious or give it a serious landscape or serious platform to perform, I think that the more public is going to take it serious. I just recently saw the Baylor Notre Dame girls basketball game. One of the better games I saw year long. Interesting enough, a friend of mine who is here with me now, I turned him on uh, coming to the Title IX tournament. It's mm -hmm. interesting to me that former athletes, once they see the girls game, uh, they're really intrigued by the under Rim game. Where do you think the girls' game is at at this point? I think it's a more cerebral game. Uh, I think the guys are, are are the ooh eye effect, and I think that's the that's what's going to fill the gyms. But if you're uh, if you're a basketball purist, if you're if you love the game of basketball, and you love um, and you can really feel the rhythm of a game that's played uh, on high level, high skill level then I think uh, girls basketball will appeal to you. If um, you like the science of it, you know, the, the cat and mouse of the whole thing, that's, that's women's basketball. Um, at, but you can't take away some of the athletes now that are playing above the rim. Um, the Brittany Grinders of the world, uh, even before her, there was a, the Sylvia Files who came out of LSU. Um, okay, we, we, we go back to Lisa Leslie, who we dunked a couple times in the WNBA. Um, the the uh, the Candace Parkers of the world, so that athlete is coming in a female package, and um, I think once the the the, the females stop trying to mimic the guys and understand it's a separate sport, and and we market it that way, then I think the appeal and the understanding and the appreciation of women's basketball will grow. Um. Another interesting perspective of this is um, in the AAU circuit. Um, I had three daughters, they were all student athletes. Uh, but what I did notice in the front court game, what do you tell to the parent who uh, gets involved with the AAU program where they promote, um, well, they kind of recruit, but more the back court players. Right. And you know what I'm saying, the front yep. court players are less developed. Right. Know, uh, how, what do you say to those kids who? Uh, uh, that really will mean so much to a collegiate program. I think that um, I think the progression of the women's game is being slowed to some some degree by the AAU and and the methodologies of the AAU uh, because they're so watered down. You have people that have um, specified agendas um, to promote and push uh, guard play um, and. The, the footwork of the big man, to see a big man or a big, a big girl, I say big man, I mean a uni, in a unisex way, the big man with, with the footwork is a beautiful sight to see for the basketball purist. Again, uh, someone who understands the game, who understands the history of the game and, and loves the game, the, fundamental, the fundamentals of the game, the inside-outside of inside outside effect of basketball. Um, so uh, we have to teach our young ladies the footwork, the basic footwork fundamentals uh, of the post 
And uh, once they get that down, it's a beautiful thing to watch. And, and once we get, uh, get the parents from, from starting out, uh, uh, one AAU program with Splinter into five or six of them because a the parent wants, wants uh, Susie to have her own team and she to be the star of the team. And, um, you know, once we get that out, out of it and, or at least control it to some degree, put more regulations on the start of new, new AAU programs, you'll get a better brand of basketball. Well, let's, since we're at the title I'm minute, starting some stuff now. <laughs> tell me your experience, uh, 40 years Title IX. How the, what, did the girl, what did you think of the girls' game, and uh, how was it treated uh, uh, as far as your history is concerned? You, you, where, how far has it come? Uh, you know, when I, I played in college, uh, one, of my, one of my things was I wasn't going to let my daughter play basketball. I had a daughter. I was a teenage dad. <clears throat> but when I came back and I was giving back and I was coaching uh, youth basketball, my daughter just displayed a natural knack of shooting the basketball. And some, somebody saw her on the side and asked, could she play for them? And she looked at me and I said, well, go ahead. And, and she got to playing and and she really, you know, showed some athletic prowess in it. And uh, their coach ended up quitting. And then uh, my daughter and, and some other parents, and they put pressure on me to coach her and her, coach their team. And on that team ended up being uh, uh, my daughter, uh, Nikki Bozeman, who went to Georgetown, uh, Marissa Coleman, who went to Maryland, um, Denisha Kenyon, who went to Virginia. Um, so we had just to name a few, uh, uh, Ashley Wissanot, who went to Arizona. Uh, just, just to name, those four girls were on that same team. So they went undefeated for like the next four years. And, and um, you know, it, it was, we wasn't teaching them how to play like boys. We were teaching them how to play the game. And those girls uh, really, really uh, took hold of that. And their, their, their love and their com competitive natures really propelled them. And each one of them guys went, went on and, and did uh, uh, had some success in their own way. Um, so uh, my history goes back to then. Um, so then I get the job at Bishop McNamara High School and um, uh, 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 like I said, a, a team or a program that's at, at the bottom of a very tough conference. Um, but they never took the game serious for on the women's side. And the guys were always promoted. And before I left McNamara, we had a, we had a, 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 a what do you call that, a, a, a pep rally. And all the time, the guys' program would be the last program introduced. Before I left McNamara, the women's program was the last program introduced and introduced to the student body. And that's something that, you know, before I left there, we had the, the, the house was packed and we had the band on the stage and <clears throat> introducing the girls and everybody in the area knew who the girls were. And we were on TV and we were doing radio interviews. And that's the kind of progression that I, I really felt like um, the women's game could have and maybe has stalled a little bit. And, um, and I have no answer to why, but I know it can be done. And um, you know, I'm a firm believer that, that programs and conferences and tournaments, such as the Title IX tournament, is, is a springboard to, to, to push it that way. Um, one last question. Um which is very interesting to me. What would you say to, um, uh, you might call it reverse intimidation of the young lady who's uh, in, a, in a scholastic situation that really wants to play, but somewhat intimidated uh, um, by, um, what's the term that they use? Uh, 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 the girly girl. <laughs> what would you say to her who's what could, what, what, what could the development do that? For, the, for the girly girl, yeah. um, I would say look at some people like uh, Candace Parker, who is uh, pound for pound, probably one of the better athletes in the world. Um, when she's on the court, she looks the part of being one of the better athletes in the world. But you take her off and take her off the court and you put her in a dress, she's beautiful. She's married, has a, uh, has a, has a beautiful daughter. Uh, you look at Leslie, Lisa.